When it snows, the grass dies, leaving nothing for animals to eat. The Arctic is a land of extreme conditions, freezing temperatures, long periods of darkness, and complete isolation. Yet, for centuries, indigenous tribes have survived and even thrived in these harsh conditions. Scattered across Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Scandinavia, and Russia, these groups have developed incredible traditions, from hunting in darkness to building homes from ice. Some tribes, however, have especially remarkable ways of life. The Yupik people believe the world around them is not just made of land and sea but also spirits. To them, everything in nature has a soul, from towering mountains to tiny fish. Their shamans, spiritual leaders, are believed to have the power to heal the sick, communicate with spirits, and bring misfortune to those who disturb nature's balance. At the center of their beliefs is Elam Ewa, the spirit of the universe that created all life. This deep respect for nature influences everything they do, from their traditions to their survival skills and even their art. Their culture is not only spoken but also carved and danced. They create beautiful masks and sculptures from wood and ivory, each telling a unique story. Their traditional dances, performed at potlatch ceremonies, help them honor their ancestors and connect with spirits. Surviving in the Arctic requires skill, knowledge, and resilience. The Yupik are experts at using the land and sea, hunting seals, walruses, and caribou with harpoons, spears, and kayaks. To survive the brutal winters, they build underground communal houses called kashim and warm shelters lined with animal skins called aina. While the Yupik look to the spirits of the land and sea for wisdom, another tribe has mastered the language of ice and snow, the Nenets. These remarkable people have lived in the harsh Siberian tundra for centuries, developing deep knowledge of snow, ice, and permafrost. One of their unique skills is their ability to read snow. Their language has many words to describe different types of snow, allowing them to predict the weather, find the best grazing spots for their reindeer, and determine safe travel conditions. In a world where climate change is rapidly altering their environment, this knowledge has become more critical than ever. Melting ice and unpredictable weather patterns are disrupting their migration routes and threatening their way of life. The Nenets live in chums, traditional cone-shaped tents made from reindeer hides. These tents are built to withstand freezing temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. The hides provide insulation, keeping the warmth inside and the cold out. These shelters are also easy to set up and take down, which is essential as the Nenets move with their herds during seasonal migrations. Family is central to Nenets society. They organize themselves into clans, passing lineage through the father. Each clan has its own customs and territory, with elders playing an important role in decision-making. However, the true spiritual leaders are the shamans, called Tardibia, who maintain harmony between humans and nature. They help ensure that the Nenets remain connected to the land that sustains them. Despite their deep connection to the land, the Nenets' way of life is under threat. Large industrial projects, such as the Yamal Mega Project, have encroached on their territory, disrupting migration routes and polluting their environment. If these changes continue, their traditional way of life may disappear forever. Survival in the Arctic is not just about enduring the cold, it's also about resisting outside forces. While the Nenets battle environmental challenges, another tribe, the Aleuts, faced a far more devastating force, colonization. The term Aleut was first used in the 18th century by Russian fur traders to describe two groups, the Unangaks of the Aleutian Islands and the Sugpayak of Kodiak Island. Although they shared similar environments, their languages and cultures were distinct. Everything changed in 1741 when Russian colonizers arrived. What began as trade soon turned into exploitation. Fur traders overhunted sea otters and seals, destroying the ecosystems the Aleuts relied on. Diseases spread rapidly, and violent conflicts broke out. As a result, the once thriving Aleut population of 25,000 dropped to just 2,000 by the late 19th century. With their people nearly wiped out, the Aleuts struggled to keep their culture alive. Their language, Unangam Tunu, once spoken by thousands, now has only about 109 fluent speakers. Losing their language has deeply affected their identity. However, they are fighting to revive their traditions, passing them down to future generations. 
The Aleut people have always had a strong connection to nature. They practiced animism and shamanism, believing that spirits existed in the sea, wind, and land. When Russian Orthodox missionaries arrived, Christianity spread among them, but instead of abandoning their old beliefs, they blended them with the new religion. For generations, Aleut men were expert hunters, navigating the dangerous seas in skin-covered kayaks called by darkers to hunt marine animals like seals, sea otters, whales, and walruses. Meanwhile, women gathered fish, birds, shellfish, and wild plants. Their survival depended on working together and maintaining a strong relationship with the land and sea. Then came World War II. In an unexpected turn, the US government forcibly relocated the Aleuts to internment camps with terrible living conditions. Families were separated, and their way of life was shattered. Their suffering went unrecognized for decades until 1988, when the Aleut Restitution Act was passed, offering compensation. But no amount of money could undo the deep scars left by war and displacement. While the Aleuts endured colonization and war, another Arctic tribe, the Koryak, faced a quieter struggle. Their culture slowly faded due to modern policies that reshaped their way of life. The Koryak people have always lived in harmony with nature, making decisions as a community rather than following strict hierarchies. Families work together, and wisdom is passed down through shamans, who guide their people through rituals and drumming. For them, nature is not just something to use, it is sacred. One of the most important aspects of Koryak culture is their deep reliance on reindeer. For centuries, reindeer have been their lifeline, providing food, clothing, tools, and transportation. They use every part of the animal, ensuring nothing goes to waste. They have also adapted to the changing seasons, building semi-underground homes to survive the cold winters and sturdy tents to stay cool in the summer. Along the coast, they crafted boats from wood and animal skins to fish and hunt marine animals. In summer, women gather berries and roots to store food for the colder months. However, outside forces have made life difficult for the Koryak. Soviet policies aimed at changing their traditional ways led to the decline of their language and customs. In 2007, the Koryak Autonomous Okrug was merged with Kamchatka Krai, reducing their political representation and making it harder for them to protect their culture. The Koryak's bond with reindeer has shaped their survival, but they are not the only Arctic people whose fate is tied to an animal. The Gwich'in people share a special connection with caribou, seeing them as more than just a food source. To them, caribou are essential to their way of life. The Gwich'in people have a deep connection with the caribou, which is essential to their identity, culture, and survival. As Sarah James, a respected leader, beautifully puts it, caribou are not just what we eat, they are who we are. This bond is reflected in their traditions, stories, and way of life. For generations, the Gwich'in have depended on the caribou for food, clothing, shelter, and tools. Their hides were used to make tents, the fur provided warmth in bedding and clothing, and the bones were turned into essential tools. More than just a source of survival, caribou are part of their spiritual and cultural beliefs. Their creation myths tell of a time when the Gwich'in and caribou were one, inseparable. Even after they became separate, they vowed to honor the caribou forever. Today, the heartbeat of Gwich'in life still follows the migration of the porcupine caribou herd. Over generations, they have mastered the skill of tracking caribou, learning their migration patterns and habits. But hunting for them is more than a necessity, it is about respect and sustainability. They ensure the caribou population remains strong for future generations. However, their fight now extends beyond tradition, they are also protecting caribou from modern threats. When oil companies targeted the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, home to the caribou's carving grounds, the Gwich'in took a stand. They saw this not just as an environmental issue but as a battle for their very way of life. With climate change and external pressures affecting caribou populations, the Gwich'in have become fierce advocates, protecting the herd and their sacred land. Just as the Gwich'in fight to protect their traditions, another indigenous group, the Even and Evenki of Siberia, has also worked to maintain their deep connection with the land. These groups have lived in Siberia for thousands of years, originally settling between Lake Baikal and the Amur River. 
Their history is shaped by interactions with other tribes and by Russian colonization in the 17th century. The imposition of fur taxes forced them to expand their territory, leading to struggles with settlers. Despite these challenges, they resisted and continued to preserve their culture. The Even and Evenki have long been nomadic, relying on reindeer for transportation and sustenance. They crafted conical tents from birch bark or reindeer hides, ensuring mobility in harsh conditions. Their diet consisted of reindeer meat, fish, and wild game, while their strong sense of community ensured that no one went without food. Elders, including shamans, played an essential role in guiding their people, offering wisdom and healing. The Even and Evenki languages, part of the Tunguzic family, link them to other indigenous Siberian groups. However, these languages are fading as younger generations adopt Russian. Another Siberian group, the Yukagir, has an even deeper spiritual connection to nature. They believe that spirits exist in every part of the world, from fire and the sun to the trees and animals. Their supreme deity, Pugu, serves as the moral judge, maintaining balance in the world. Alongside this belief, each Yukagir clan has a shaman, or Alma, who serves as a bridge between the physical and spiritual worlds. These shamans are deeply respected, and after their passing, they are honored as sacred figures. For the Yukagir, animals are more than just a source of food, they are spiritual beings. Each species has its own spirit, and hunters must follow sacred traditions to honor them. These customs have been passed down for generations, ensuring harmony with nature. Their deep respect for the land extends to trees, which they see as protectors. They hold ceremonies to honor them, reinforcing their belief that every part of nature has a soul. Dreams also play a significant role in Yukagir culture. They believe dreams can predict the future, helping guide them through the dangers of their environment. Shamans interpret these visions, offering advice on seasonal changes, personal struggles, and survival. Despite the influence of Russian Orthodox Christianity, many Yukagir still blend their shamanic traditions with newer religious beliefs. Survival in Siberia has required adaptability. The Yukagir once crafted all their tools from natural materials, using wood, bone, and stone instead of metal. They built strong wooden shelters in winter and lightweight portable homes in summer. Their deep spiritual connection to the land has allowed them to thrive for centuries. Further north, the Inuit have mastered life in the harsh Arctic environment. For them, the frozen landscape is not just a place to survive, it is home. Hunting has always been central to their way of life. They use harpoons to catch sea creatures and bows and arrows for land animals. Their ability to adapt is seen in their use of kayaks and larger boats to navigate icy waters. Caribou play a vital role in Inuit culture, providing food, clothing, and tools. The hides are used for warmth, the fat fuels oil lamps, and the bones are shaped into tools. Inuit clothing, made from seal or caribou skin, is designed for extreme cold. Their language, Inuktitut, carries their history and traditions, connecting generations. Inuit art, carved from soapstone, walrus tusks, and bones, depicts animals and daily life, holding deep spiritual meaning. During winter, Inuit families build igloos, which provide insulation against the freezing temperatures. In the summer, they switch to tents made from animal skins or turf huts near hunting areas. Community and cooperation are central to Inuit life. They share food from hunts and teach children through observation rather than punishment. However, modern challenges have disrupted traditional Inuit life. Settling into permanent communities has limited hunting opportunities, leading to food insecurity. Store-bought food is often expensive and less nutritious than their traditional diet. Social issues, including high suicide rates and mental health struggles, have also arisen as the Inuit navigate rapid changes to their way of life. In Siberia, the Kanti and Monsi tribes share a spiritual bond with the bear, which they see as an ancestor and protector. For them, hunting a bear is not just about survival, it is a sacred ritual. After a hunt, they hold ceremonies filled with singing, dancing, and storytelling to honor the bear's spirit. They believe this process helps them cope with the responsibility of taking the bear's life and reinforces their connection to nature. 
These tribes also follow a traditional social structure where family ties pass through the male line. Their spiritual practices are deeply woven into their daily lives, with shamans acting as guides between the human and spirit worlds. Despite modern influences, efforts are being made to preserve their culture. The Kantimonsi Autonomous Okrug in Russia is dedicated to protecting their traditions, language, and way of life. Across the northern regions of Europe, the Sami people have lived for thousands of years, adapting to their cold environment. Their origins trace back over 10,000 years, following the last ice age. They were traditionally hunters, fishers, and gatherers, moving with the seasons to sustain themselves. Around 1500 CE, they began domesticating reindeer, which became central to their culture. Today, reindeer herding remains a defining part of Sami life, especially in Norway and Sweden, where it is legally protected. Every part of the reindeer is used, from its meat to its hide. Traditional dishes like bedos, a reindeer stew, highlight the deep connection they have with their herds. The Sami continue to migrate with their reindeer, ensuring fresh grazing areas. However, the Sami have faced challenges over the centuries. Scandinavian governments imposed taxes, took their land, and attempted to convert them to Christianity. Despite these pressures, they have held on to their traditions. Their unique singing style, called joik, is one of Europe's oldest musical forms, used to honor people, animals, and places. Sami craftsmanship, known as juoji, includes woven textiles, carved wood, and silver jewelry, all reflecting their deep connection to nature. Their traditional clothing, the gakti, is colorful and decorated with silver, representing pride in their culture. Spirituality remains an important part of Sami life, rooted in animism, the belief that all parts of nature have spirits. Sacred sites, such as special stones and trees, continue to play a role in their rituals.